So good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Roger Birchmore. I'm the secretary of the Auckland SIBZ committee. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here to this evening's technical session. We're running this via the cloud and also in person out of Christchurch. And I'd like to thank Hamza Hijazi and Heath Turnbull, uh, who have worked hard to make this event happen. Um, and um, I'm sure it's gonna be an evening of uh, some very interesting discussion. So just before we get into the detail of it, um, we've got the slide on the screen there, which we're sharing with you, um, titling the event. And just a couple of things in terms of the SIBSI organization, I'd just like to share with you. Oh, um, there are a couple of ways of keeping in touch with the SIBSI. And we have here on the screen uh, some uh, G code links, which uh, I'll just leave up there for a couple of moments to see whether uh, if you'd like to take and record those, but also there's a web address up there that will take you to the recorded session for this a little bit later on. I'll put this screen up again at the end of the session for you to note anything down or for you to use the, the G codes. Just uh, for particularly for SIBS members or people who are hoping to become SIBSI members, we've got some key dates up there on the screen. These dates are the times that the UK membership committee will be accepting uh, memberships. And once they've gone through all their protocols, they will then make contact with us here in New Zealand to move through for the professional interviews, which wherever we can take place here in New Zealand. Um, but those are some key target dates if you are planning to submit your membership applications to and we, we certainly look forward to receiving those. If we have any students who are part of the discussion today um, and you might be studying a career that uh, is very broad based, um, we'd certainly like you to encourage you to think about becoming a SIBSI member and there's a link here that gives you a particular guide for information that might be relevant to you during your studies. So we're just about to get into the program. So for participants, uh, just a couple of little details, depending upon your Zoom screen, you may well see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. Um, we'd invite you to use the Q&A icon to record your questions during the session. Um, what that allows is for Hansa and I to monitor those and to pull those questions together. And we can make sure that uh, those questions are put to Katie um, after her presentation. So if you can use the Q&A, that will be just perfect. So now what I'd like to do is introduce to you Katie. Uh, Katie is the Principal Advisor Engineering in the Building Systems Performance Branch at the MBIE, and that's within the Building for Climate Change program. Uh, so Katie's working as a consultant engineer and she's developed tools and methodologies to integrate carbon assessment into the building design process. Um, and also as a part of her previous research work at Cambridge University, she's authored a number of academic papers on this subject. So uh, I'd like to, uh, like to welcome Katie to this evening's presentation and I'd invite the Oricon team to turn on their microphones. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen and if you'd like to start sharing the screen, um, the floor is yours, Katie, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Roger, and uh, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for that introduction. And yeah, I was just saying to Heath that I think possibly both of us had forgotten. You don't normally have meetings like this on a Friday night. <laughs> In Canterbury, this is effectively a Friday night because we've got our anniversary holiday tomorrow. So thanks to everyone in Canterbury for uh, sacrificing the start of the long weekend to, to be here. Um, yeah, because it, it's been postponed a couple of times this event, you know, COVID and other things. So, so yeah, it's great to actually finally uh, get here. Um, so, yeah, as Roger said, I'm Principal Advisor Engineering in the uh, yeah, um, 
what's called the building performance and engineering team within building system performance. Essentially, we're the team of about 20 people that look after the building code and the other um, associated building regulatory instruments that, that go without the acceptable solutions and the verification methods. Um, but uh, a big part of my role it, um, since I started at I mean, I've only been there a year. My background is as a structural engineer. I previously worked for um, WSP here in, in Christchurch and a small consulting firm called BMC. Um, although you know, I've only been in New Zealand for four years, I've, I've worked previously to that as a structural engineer in the UK. So yeah, my um, I have got some expertise in low carbon material and body carbon, and uh, I was really excited to start this new job at MB. Um, because yeah, they're launching this building for climate change program, which is right up my street. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Um, so yeah, we're going to give I'll give you a quick overview of the program. Um, we've recently done a public consultation of the program. So just to summarise that, we'll talk about a bit about how it uh, how it will impact building services and um, team members and how we can work together and how we can hear your views and then some time for questions at the end. Hopefully we've all got lots of questions because it's not a very long presentation, so. <laughs> but I've given a few of these webinars to various different groups and um, the most valuable bit is the, the questions that come at the end and the discussion, so. So yeah, just a quick sort of overview of, uh, well, the problem or the challenge, I suppose it should be worded in a positive way. So. Um, we, we, we as a nation in New Zealand are set to be zero carbon by 2050, uh, which isn't that long away now. Uh, so there's various different ways we can achieve that, uh, breaking it down by sort of sectors, building and construction sector has got a part to play um, and we're going to have to make some big changes. So as a result of the, um, yeah, we've obviously the, the um, Climate Change Act, uh, Zero Carbon Act came into force last year in 2019, set that goal of being zero carbon by 2050, uh, set up the Climate Change Commission, um, which sets up these five-year um, carbon budgets that lead up to being zero by 2050. And in response to that, the government, so, so the Climate Change Commission is an independent body. Um, in response to that, the New Zealand government is uh, producing a plan that's going to meet the um, budgets as set by the Climate Change Commission. So all sorts of um, different sectors are um, contributing to that plan, uh, building and construction being one, and the Building for Climate Change program is what will what will feed into that um, plan um, in terms of uh, the building and construction sector. Uh, and yes, not a very pretty diagram to explain it, but yeah, Zero Carbon Act at the top. So there's um, two goals of the Zero Carbon Act actually, reducing emissions to become zero carbon um, and improving resilience. So um, basically making sure we're adapting uh, well to climate change that is, we already know is going to happen. Hopefully we'll make, we can mitigate the worst impacts by reducing emissions, but there's already enough emissions in the system that we know our climate is going to change. So yes, in response to um, these carbon budgets, we're reducing emissions through the National Emissions Reduction Plan, and that's the government, that's the whole of government response. It's split into five sectors. Um, building and construction is one, so that's what our program is feeding into. Um, uh, land use and agriculture is another, waste is another, transport is another, and heat and industrial power is the other one. Uh, so they're the five sectors, so we essentially are forming one-fifth of the National Emissions Reduction Plan. Um, improving resilience uh, is another whole of government program to address this as well. They, there's a National Climate Change Risk Assessment that was published earlier this year, I think in August. Uh, so that was published and that sets the clock for a two-year um, uh, program to come up with a National Adaptation Plan, so in August 2022. That'll be a national adaptation plan that will say how, as New Zealand as a nation, we're going to adapt to the, um, uh, to the impacts of climate change. And, and yeah, so our programme, the Building for Climate Change programme at the bottom there, we are providing the input to those um, all of government efforts from the building and construction sector. So transforming the sector, um, we've got two goals driven by the 
like a, a previous slide, it's reducing emissions and improving resilience. So it's pretty simple, really. And everything that we do within the building the climate change program, we've got to tie back to those um, those two goals. Um, reducing emissions, we're um, looking at emissions holistically from the from the sector. So that's not just operating buildings, but um, the emissions associated with constructing and um, putting buildings together and the materials that go into buildings themselves as embodied, um, embodied emissions. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a big challenge and it's a big plan and it's, a, it's very much a long-term plan. It's not something that we're going to do in the next you know, year or so or even you know, over a number of years over kind of quick fixes. We're, we're trying to look at it from a, um, a sort of system change um, perspective to try and, um, yeah, um, yeah, it's a, we'll talk about it being a once in a generation um, opportunity to, to change the way we look at buildings, not just not just sort of design them, but how we build them, how we operate them, everything to do with buildings we're going to need to kind of re revisit. So to address this um, and start the conversation really on what we need to be done uh, to do, we recently ran a public, public consultation on um, two frameworks that both address the first part of our, um, of our objectives, which is the reducing emissions objective. So the way we split it, um, operational efficiency, picture of the, the um, island on the front. So that's, um, that's our framework for um, how we're reducing um, operational emissions in buildings, but also I should say it's, it's doesn't have emissions in the title. It is, we've kept efficiency in the title, and we're talking about transforming operation efficiency because it's yeah not just about reducing emissions. It's also about using it as an opportunity to make sure that we are um, improving uh, the internal environment qualities of um, buildings and using particularly housing. You know, that there are some quite long-standing issues with the uh, quality of, of um, internal environments and housing. And we definitely didn't want um, uh, a low, I mean, you can save a lot of energy in housing by just not heating them at all. So that's a pretty good result in terms of carbon, but obviously not what we're trying to get to. Um, we do want people to be warm and dry and healthy in their homes, as well as use less carbon. So that's the uh, operational efficiency framework. And then the second one is the one that I've been leading more on, which is um, whole of life and body carbon. So this is building materials, how buildings are constructed, um, but looking at that all the way through the whole life. So even through the operational phase, when I think about um, you know, repair and maintenance activities and emissions associated with those, uh, right through to the end of life, and what happens when a building isn't needed or wanted anymore, uh, if it gets demolished or used or recycled, how can we um, be thinking about that? Um, now, in terms of how we're designing building, or thinking about new buildings being constructed today, thinking about what's going to happen to them at their end of life in terms of reducing carbon. And so these documents, they're not they're not massive, um, uh, and they are quite high level, but uh, they do con contain some um, proposals of, of how we, um, uh, yeah, how we think we could go about it. And it is a conversation starter. They are proposals, um, and so we went out to this consultation definitely by. Sort of saying it's not set in stone. If you think there's some fundamental flaws in this that you know isn't going to achieve our objective of reducing emissions, the last thing we want to do is put something forward that's actually going to you know, increase emissions by some sort of perverse outcome um, way. So uh, yeah, we um, but we have put forward something in there to kind of start the conversation. And just out of interest, um, I, does anybody is anybody aware? from the audience here aware of these documents or the consultation that we did some nodding <laughs> <laughs> I know that I think the city had a um, symposium or something at the beginning of September and uh, no one from MB was able to talk I believe but um, we worked quite close with the New Zealand Green Building Council and I think Andrew Eagles was there and was possibly talking about well he, he did talk about um, this program um, as part of his presentation there. So hopefully, um, yeah, some um, some of your members are aware. But I think it is worth saying that, you know, the building sector is, is large and complex and there's 
lots of different stakeholders, um, building services uh, isn't perhaps a, a, a group of stakeholders that we've been very good with engaging with in the past, so really keen to, to develop that um, here. Um, as you might, yeah, I've said, I, I come from the UK and from working in this area in the UK over, I don't know, 10, 15 years, um, I was always a bit gutted as a, I'm a structural engineer and but wanted to you know do the right thing and contribute to um, reducing carbon and I was always a bit annoyed that building services engineers always used to get in there and and they'd you know talk about their massive their impact and how you know they, they have this really big role to play which you do so um so it's be really great to kind of to to hear that from you as part of this process um Anyway, moving on, so uh, yeah, a bit more about the, the framework. So yeah, the first one is about operation efficiency. It's about reducing emissions from um, the use of buildings. Um, uh, it's about reducing water use as well um, for the sake of the emissions associated with um, delivering um, potable water is one thing, obviously, but also just to be more um, resource efficient without water use. and. Um, those in Auckland will be, um, well, down here, we're all um, aware of the increasing likelihood of droughts and increasing frequency of water shortages and water restrictions. So, being um, making sure our buildings are designed to be as water efficient as possible, see a good thing. Uh, but then, yeah, as I was saying, also in improving people's health and well-being. We don't want to consider operational efficiency in isolation from um, indoor environmental quality parameters to make sure that, um, yeah, as I said, buildings can be um, uh, yeah, warm, dry, uh, comfortable, as well as low carbon. And yeah, building services engineers have a really big part to play in that, of course, with, um, heating and cooling of larger buildings and uh, ensuring yeah, good ventilation. So that's the first framework, transforming operation efficiency. This one is uh, yeah, reducing whole of life and body carbon. So um, how I frame this is uh, by, first of all, making sure we're getting the most out of the buildings that we build today. So making sure that uh, the, the size and the, the quantity of, of new buildings that we build are proportional to the need. So we're not kind of unnecessarily wasting embodied carbon in terms of excessive use of materials by a building that perhaps isn't, isn't needed. Um, looking at our existing infrastructure and existing buildings and see if, see if there are better ways that we can uh, upgrade or refurbish existing buildings rather than build new. Um, and increasing the longevity of new buildings so that we're not rebuilding again and again after earthquakes or change of use or, or you know, changing, changing climate. So thinking about um, how we can make sure that we're we are getting the most out of um, a building that we build today for a long period of time to avoid having to do more new builds in the future. Uh, second thing is about increasing, increasing um, the uh, material efficiency of the buildings that we do use. So once we've decided we really do need this new building, how can we really make sure that it delivers the, um, uh, the, the, the needs for the building your occupants and users, um, but using it, so it still does that, but being really clever and efficient with the amount of materials that we're using, um, and that also covers reducing waste um, and minimising yeah, replacement over the building's life, life cycle of yeah, some of the aspects of the, of the products and materials that are used in buildings. And then uh, finally, it's only really to be done those two things that you can get to looking at the carbon intensity of materials in new buildings. So this is where you're looking at embodied carbon coefficients and saying, okay, well, yes, if I have to use that much material, how can I reduce the footprint of that material as much as, as, much as possible? So this is working with um, supply chains to, um, to uh, yeah, reduce the footprint of their, of their materials and products um, um, during manufacturing, um, but also uh, perhaps using uh, making design choices to use low carbon alternatives where possible. Um, so, yeah, it could be something like timber instead of concrete, or, or uh, that, that's quite a simplistic, obvious one. But there are other there are other issues, there are other, um, aspects where you can make design design decisions that uh, yeah, reduce reduce that body carbon of your materials. 
So, yeah, I'll just quickly go on to the consultation. So we, um, yeah, the consultation was launched in, in it was August. I think we did get about the end of August and around just six weeks. We had over 350 submissions, um, mainly responding to the um, particular questions at, at, the, at the back of the document. But we also had people just submitting um, bespoke written submissions, which was really great to see people putting the time and effort into tell us um, what they thought and how we could do things differently or how um, whether they agreed with what we'd said. Uh, it's nice to see that uh, yeah, more than 90% agree that um, action is needed to reduce emissions. Um, and we're going through the process at the moment of sort of analysing all those submissions um, we closed a few weeks ago um, and we'll be releasing a summary of the, of the submissions uh, later this year. And that analysis will will form the next steps, basically, which is which is how we um, develop the um, develop these frameworks, develop the, the policies and the proposals in those frameworks, and put them into put them into practice. Um, yeah, and there'll, there'll be more. There will definitely be more um, opportunities uh, to consult. This is. Yeah, we, we see this as a very much a long-term plan. It's not like, okay, this is it, and then when we've done it, we'll move on. We're going to be continually adapting um, and improving it. Um, so much so that, in fact, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, um, uh, yeah, I, I called it, so, so the, the whole of life and body carbon framework is, implies that it covers the whole of life and building. Um, but within the document, there's, um, I, I, we spent a bit of time looking at the scope of what this could cover because it could, you know, could be massive. Um, but how do we make that kind of manageable for a sector um, and introducing a new concept that um, not many jurisdictions around the world look at at all? I mean, there is a growing interest in it around the world, but not many people do. But yeah, the first scope item we looked at was was life cycle stages, and we're actually proposing uh, initially. To, um, to just look at the, uh, the, the stages of a building's life cycle up to when the building is open. So, and not worry too much about the end of life and the operational phase of the building when it comes to operate, when it comes to embodied carbon. So it doesn't escape me that that's not what I said on the front cover, but um, it's, about, it's about trying to put something out there that, is, um, that brings the sector along on the journey, you know, and, and um, to make it more manageable to start with, try to, to cut it down. But we received interesting feedback on that, and we might well change that. We might well say, yeah, we are actually going to um, talk about them. Um, we are going to look at uh, a whole of life right from the beginning. We'll, we'll, we'll see. And that, yeah, the analysis that we received will form part of those proposals. Because, uh, yeah, sure, yeah, I mean, the main, I should say, that's not on there, I guess the headline, if you wanted a summary of what these documents say, uh, or propose is that we're going to regulate carbon emissions in the building sector. So we're going to regulate operational emissions and we're going to re regulate embodied carbon emissions. And how we propose to do that is by requiring um, reporting of those two types of emissions um, and then eventually uh, putting on a cap, um, which may come earlier for the operational carbon emissions as they're a bit more well uh, yeah, well regulated already. We already have a clause in the building code that deals with, with um, operation energy efficiency in buildings. But um, so we may well cap that earlier. But the intention is to cap both um, operational emissions and body carbon emissions. And the idea being you won't be able to get a building consent unless you can demonstrate that your building will come in under those under those caps. So what does this mean for building services and subsidy members? So significant user of energy in buildings. So um, we are addressing um, building services uh, and, and their design in the building climate change program. It's addressed specifically in the operational efficiency framework in terms of putting uh, requirements in for services efficiency. Um, in the embodied carbon framework, I haven't. Uh, we haven't said at the moment it's not in that initial scope. Um, we've said that for the moment we're going to focus on the kind of high mass elements of a building, so the foundations, uh, the structure, the, the 
bones of the bones of a building that last the whole life, so the foundations and the superstructure, um, and but perhaps also looking at um, other um, other elements that that do um, cover lots of body carbon, so the, the tiling and the, and the building envelope, the roofing materials, that kind of thing. And so at the moment, building services are in there, but I I am aware that there's quite a lot of research out there, and I've seen some see um, uh, papers as well about um, the body carbon of, of building services. Um, they can be significant, and it may just be that you know at the moment the kind of the general consensus is that actually the bulk of the body carbon of the building is in those high mass elements, which is why we've opted to go for them first. You know, get the biggest bang for buck first. But it may well be that there just hasn't been enough research into this area of, of the potential impact of, um, of building services, especially, you know, they probably uh, replaced over uh, more um, yeah, over the lifetime of the building, so that kind of adds up. Um, so it may be that as more research and, and work is done in this area, it is found to be a, a, a bigger impact. And so, yeah, we will, we will be including it. I mean, we, we will be including it anyway because we know it's not nothing, but uh, in terms of the uh, relative significance to other elements, we'll be watching that closely. Um, but we've also got some uh, short term changes coming up um, that I uh, called the call the first steps of the climate change programme. So, um, I don't know if how many of you know that we uh, update the building code every year. Now we were doing it every two years, but we um, this year was COVID, and um, we decided that actually once a year is a kind of a better time to get. Um, yeah, twice a year is quite hard work for us and the sector to get to get the sort of feedback out. So um, uh, um, yeah, every year we update the building code, and next year it will be the turn of um, building code clause H1. So I don't know if you were familiar with the code clause H1, it's the um, code clause that deals with energy efficiency. Um, so we're going to be updating the um, supporting documents behind that code clause, the acceptable solutions and the verification methods um, in next year's building code update. Um, our annual building code cycle is that uh, we put a public consultation out in April, that's right, March, April, it'd be the beginning of April. Um, it will run for, I think, eight weeks. Um, we analyse the results, we do our analysis statement, and then the, um, the actual change occurs in November each year um, with a year's transition period. So when actually come, you won't have to comply with it until the following November. Um, so in fact, the 2020 Building Code update just came out last week. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in uh, 2021, we're looking at updating Copals H1, and um, here's a bit of a interaction um, segment. Does anybody know about building code clause H1.3.6? Yeah. yeah. Oh, HVAC systems. Yeah. Okay, so I've had, you know, it's not looking. Yeah, that's good. Say so someone, um, Heath, Heath knows it. That's good. Sibsy membership. <laughs> I just learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Right. Well, that's that's really interesting. So because um, there's no compliance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So currently, there's no way to kind of demonstrate how yeah. you comply with that. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure everyone in this room does, but um, there are potentially people out there that aren't complying with it, and there isn't any way to to stop that because we haven't got any compliance documents that that show building consent authorities the kind of thing that you would need to do to comply. So, so one of the things we're intending to do uh, in the public consultation next year is to address those requirements, and, and we're proposing to have a new verification method um, for HVAC systems. And this verification method is going to be based on this guidance that um, put the screenshot there. It was published in 2011, so it's a bit out of date. We're going to be updating it, bringing it up to um, today's standards. Um, but that's essentially based on kind of existing good practice. Uh, we need to, by incorporating it as a verification method, we, you know, that, that basically means, well, how are you going to the building code sets the kind of minimum 
standards. So there'll be a bit of, sort of tweaking to ensure we're doing that. But um, yeah, that the, the 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 point of that is to is to really get um, the sector kind of warmed up to to bigger changes to come. I mean, this won't this certainly won't be the last change we do to H1. Um, it might not even you know H1 might not even exist as it as it currently stands. So we we'll have to see. Um, but we're just trying to, um, yeah, get 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 the sector into the mode of thinking. All oh, right, yeah, I do actually need to worry about the energy efficiency of my um, HVAC systems, yeah. even though it's in the building code. But but actually, no, no, there isn't really much to to, to um, justify or verify it with at the moment. So there is, hopefully, um, we'll just now there will be something there um, next year. And it's about helping the sector demonstrate. But it's not about putting up more barriers it's about helping demonstrate compliance with a rule that already exists and actually is only going to get tighter um, with, as we implement more and more of this of this program so, yeah uh, actually uh, are, are any, is anyone this is another question does it, is anyone aware of that guidance document that is on our website about um, how you can design HVAC systems to be energy efficient no, no, that's fine. <laughs> that's absolutely fine. I'm just curious um, because, yeah, that's obviously a challenge um, that we have this. I mean, you know, I know as a when I practice as a structural engineer, I didn't really open the building code much. And, you know, you're, yeah, your building's got to stand up. You know, you open the, the codes of practice, you, you, you design standards that you work with every day. So it's just interesting for us to, um, yeah, get get the kind of feeling from the um, from the sector about how we can, how, what, what are the kind of channels we can use, you know, putting a single document up on our website and perhaps doing the trick. Um, so uh, yeah, so what's ahead? So we've got, yeah, so the, um, the, the mission, the emission mitigation framework closed in October, closed last month. Um, We'll be considering the feedback from all, from all of that um, and releasing the summary of the submissions uh, soon. We'll be uh, doing future consultations on implementing the frameworks um, and how we're going to put them into regulation. Um, that will be coming shortly after the, the analysis. Um, but yeah, those those first steps that we're doing is kind of you know, things that we know need to change now rather than to kind of work its way through the system. Things that we know we need to change now, um, there'll be, uh, yeah, a consultation on that will start in April. So do keep your eyes peeled out for that and um, and that will come into effect in, in November. And, oh, how do I go back? Oh. So, um, yeah, what you can do. So, as I said, you know, um, building services engineers perhaps not a not a group that we've been, that we've engaged with much before. So it would be really great to hear um, your voice on these changes that we're proposing to make because you know, they are they will be big changes, and we want to do them in a way that um, is going to work for, for everyone. You know, it's, they'll, it's going to be challenging, but you know, we need to address big challenge of climate change so we are going to you know once we've kind of accepted that we are going to have to make these big changes um, how can we do that in the sort of most pain-free way or the most efficient way and the best thing for us to do is to talk to the people in the sector who are doing it every day so um, yeah make your voices heard in this process um, providing evidence and, and, and feedback to us on you know when we make some of these decisions um, about you know, how we're going to regulate this we just we have to make the decisions on the evidence that we have at the time and the feedback that we hear and um, yeah you know if someone comes with a contradictory argument and they've got a really good you know they can provide the evidence that shows something but it's but it's not going to be good for building services then we, we need to hear the other side of that story so um, really engaging with us um, and providing that that robust evidence and feedback that we as the regulator can. To, to make those decisions is really, really important. Uh, the building code updates um, uh, 
program. Um, it's be great to get your um, get your feedback on that. As I said, the one on specifically targeting HVAC will hopefully be coming out with the, the in the 2021 consultation in April. Uh, but it's not it's not just going to be about HVAC. There are other changes that we're making to to actually other sections of the building code, but also in H1 as well. Um, uh, to do with thermal uh, thermal efficiency um, um, R values, minimum R values of, of um, buildings, which may affect you as well. But um, yeah, but this um, the HVAC system will be, will be uh, a big part, a big part of that update. So you know, obviously, really, really important that we hear your views on that. So all of that will help us um, making decisions. And. So, um, yeah, happy to take any questions now. Um, there's some links there. So, the, the Bill of Climate Change Programme has got its own page on the MB website. Um, uh, but we've also got the uh, building code. Yeah, uh, my the branch, the team that I work in, has its own website called building.gov.nz. And that's where you can get more general information about the building code, the building system um, and yeah, news on the, on the code updates. Thanks. So I'm going to take any questions. Yeah, so Heath, if um, yeah, Roger, yeah, Roger Birchmore here. Heath, could I just ask you to um, canvas your visitors there in, uh, in, in person, first of all, to, uh, to see whether we've got some questions. And whilst we're just doing that, um, I'm just we haven't got any written questions yet and maybe for the participants maybe uh, the questions might be best addressed verbally um, we can allow that to happen so if you'd like to ask something if you think it would be easier to ask it verbally if you can just just use the Q&A say can I ask something verbally then we can make your microphone live and uh, we will allow you to uh, answer that question live so Please think about that um, and take that opportunity. But whilst you're thinking about that, um, Heath, let's pass over to you just to see whether you've got questions from the uh, audience in Christchurch. Um, I, I just see that the, the whole compliance and regulation, like I, you're going to have to set up a whole separate body to check on everyone once a year to make sure that they're meeting targets. Or, uh, yeah, matter. so the compliance process. Yeah, it is, uh, is something that we uh, are going to need to address. Um, I think at the moment we're thinking, um, you know, we, we we talk to BCAs um, quite a lot, the building consent authorities, and, you know, the feedback we've got already is, you know, look, we're not going to have the uh, expertise to, to know whether, you know, whether this is complying, you know, it's a totally new thing for, for, for most people, including BCAs. Um, and, and even if they've got the expertise, it's the time as well. Um, so what we're looking at doing is, is um, yeah, setting up some kind of tool that kind of does that check for a, for a BCA, um, for, yeah, building consent officer for them, so that uh, you know it comes to them and they just need to check whether it's gone through the tool and it's, it's um, deemed to you know, comply or not. Um, but yeah, there's obviously a lot of work to do. Um, that in terms of how it gets uh, about it, how the how the compliance system gets implemented, and and it's alongside with all the other issues that we know already exist <laughs> with getting a building through a building consent, uh, getting a building consent and going through that process, and uh, there's a whole other work stream. So I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the construction sector accord, but that's something that that they're looking at. So, idea of a new consenting model and trying to um, yeah, get more efficient uh, building, building consent process because it's not working for many people, if anyone at the moment. So, so oh no, <coughs> it, it, it's going to be a tangle to get, like developers don't want to spend money at the best of times and building owners don't want to spend more money, so whether that's done with the, um, you know, it, the monitoring, self-monitoring that reports that or that, mm -hmm. it's all about what you're talking about, but um, but would there be, you know, obviously it's going to be legislated or part of building code, but is, what, what is government doing to, I'm talking about wider nature, just everything, to say, 
look, we're going to, if you make your building extra efficient, we're going to, where's government subsidies? Like, I, I think New Zealand's yeah. far behind it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, financial incentives and those kind of levers and um, something else we're looking at. Um, yeah, because, yeah, you're absolutely right. We need to look at what's, but, you know, if we're going to put money at it, we need to know what's the most effective, where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of, you know, actual reductions in emissions. So there's that process to go through. Um, uh, I mean, the, the Labour government, the new Labour government, put in their manifesto that they were going to do um, energy labelling um, buildings, so I guess we're going to do that. <laughs> but, but on that, I mean, we've got some obviously some established schemes and tools at our disposal, yeah. right? So, um, yeah. and so it's quite quite encouraging to hear you say, obviously, at the very baseline, at the least insulation levels, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. all that sort of stuff's going to be reassessed. Yeah. And then it sounds like some sort of annual um, review of performance, or is that, is um, that something that's being introduced, or is it is it purely focused on the design stage of the building. Yeah, the so at the moment things. we're looking, yeah, so that's a good question. So existing buildings and new buildings uh, and, you know, testing existing buildings as they go on. We're, we are looking at, um, uh, yeah, post-occupancy evaluation and that kind, of, um, that kind of thing for at least checking immediately after occupation that it's being worked through properly. But in terms of looking at existing buildings that's currently not in the scope of this program right. and we've had a lot of feedback saying well let's not achieve anything then because yeah. you know our existing building stock is a, obviously a big part of the emissions which it is um i guess we're coming at it from the point well we've got we've currently got the, the building code that um is a tool at our disposal to um to regulate new buildings so Let's use that tool to make sure that the buildings that we build from today are going to be good, um, because yeah, the buildings that we build today are the existing <coughs> buildings of the future. We don't want to have to be going retrofitting new buildings in you know, 20 years' time that were built today. We want to build them right today. So that's that's kind of a couple of reasons for focusing on 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 new buildings. Um, but I can see it quickly, you know, having to having to um, expand into existing buildings and. I mean, Neighbours is a Neighbours is a good example of a scheme that, um, yeah, um, government I think you know, uh, government property I think is already um, mandating that Neighbours ratings are going to be required for their properties, so that's good. Um, but yeah, how we can incorporate that into into this program is something that we'll look to do in the future. But at the moment, we're yeah, focusing on um, yeah design and the and the construction processes of new buildings. In terms of um, um, how the process of the design and the building is, is, is currently um, occurring now, I think there needs some sort of changes that needs to happen there in terms of how the expertise and the professional are involved uh, in the stages of the design, yeah. particularly with building services. Yeah. By experience, another CG a long campaign in UK to have building services engage at early stages yeah. of design. Yeah. Do you see something kind of happening yeah. here? Or yeah, I mean, there? yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, if that's the if that's the sort of thing that we need to do, then we need to look at how, as government, we can um, we can encourage that and drive that behaviour. What what options have we got to? to to, to try and encourage that, um, I should say another another aspect proposal that we put forward in these um, documents is that any changes that we make, we want to um, want to make sure that the government property is demonstrating how that it can work in practice. So, so government leading the way. So any requirements that we put in, we want to put in as a requirement for government properties first. So they can and always use that sort of pilot, you know, just and, and that I think goes through to the um, consenting process as well um, to make sure that we can work through those issues with um, yeah, compliance, um, try and get them done first, and then learn the lessons from them before it goes to the rest of the sector. Um, yeah, I'm already talking to. Um, got a, a sort of government property group that we 
talk to with, with yeah, arms of the government that have big property portfolios and it's kind of aura being a really big one. But the Ministry of Education being another really big one and you know, they've got their own design guidelines that um, they're really good, a good resource and a good sort of model so to try and get some of this thinking into those um, things. Um, Ministry of Health and Ministry of uh, Defence as well, I think. Ministry of Justice, I think there's a few. Um, oh, and, and the uh, yeah, Government Property and Procurement, GPP, um, who set the procurement rules for all government <laughs> buildings, so they're obviously yeah, important. And they, you know, they've got their own um, you know, sustainable construction guidelines, so we're talking with them to make sure that we're all um, aligned. It all sounds aspirational and not, not, you know, you're trying to have that 2050 uh, yeah. target. Yeah. Aspirations don't get things done. Teeth, you need some teeth somewhere. And, um, yeah. Where's that coming from? Um, yeah, well, we've had, yeah, I mean, we, you know, lots of the feedback we've had so far is, um, you know, it's, it's all very positive, it's all very good, and it's encouraging us to, to be bold, you know, and just and to make it happen and to and to push forward, you know, especially in the kind of post-COVID um, environment, you know, we're um, aware that any any kind of indication that this is going to push up costs of, uh, or you know, price of housing at the moment, um, obviously that's you know just off the off the table, but um, yeah, so we're looking at how can we implement these changes in a cost-neutral way. Um, and you know there will be some, there will be additional costs, but how are they going to be offset um, over the life cycle, or how can we, as the government, provide a way to to, yeah, to offset that, that, that any additional upfront cost? Um, but yeah, I mean the teeth comes in making it mandatory, making it a mandatory requirement, putting in those putting in those caps. So it's yeah, interesting, it's um, it gave us a bit of foreshadow there with the H1 mm -hmm. um, and potentially suggesting that there might be some actual measurement or method of measurement um, given, um, and then suggesting perhaps a, a cap that's um, the benchmark is gradually yeah. improving. Yeah. So it suggests that energy modelling effectively will become potentially part of that building um, consent process, which traditionally hasn't really been. Yeah. Um, yeah. Seems you be modelling to be done pretty much just to um, either um, respond to clients' uh, yeah. needs or um, rating schemes. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a tool that's been sitting there underutilised from, yeah. yeah. from a long term perspective. So yeah. it sounds like that's sort of the, the tool that you've got at your disposal to. Yeah, yeah, and you know, feedback from you guys on what's what's a good tool and what's not a good tool. <laughs> Um, that's really, really valuable. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, there's, there's definitely an aspect of, I mean, okay, we've got 350 submissions, but, you know, we're probably preaching it to, to the converted a bit. We did get some climate change deniers, actually. <laughs> <Not exact. laughs> it's a complete waste of money. Why are you doing this? No problem. Okay. Um, only about three. Um, but most of the people are, you know, they're, like, they're, like, they're already engaged, they're already doing this stuff, and we do have to be aware that we're getting, we're hearing from the people that are going, yeah, go for it, you know, <laughs> go for it, just be bold, just keep going, you know, we're already doing this stuff. They're probably already, they're the oricons of this, world, you know, they're probably up, up there already. Um, we've got to remember that there's a whole building sector out there um, that, that goes to the lowest common denominator denominator which is currently you know which is the building code so how do we raise that raise that bar at the same time as setting the you know the aspiration to to drive best practice um, yeah so energy modeling you know how many building buildings you know I, yeah use energy modeling at the design stage we were, you know I don't know you guys probably know so that'd be interesting to know <laughs> um, so if we you know if we're going to Mandate this is that is that a is that a massive impact or is it actually everyone's doing it anyway? Like those are the kind of things that we want to tease out. Understand? Yeah. Yeah, so, so Heath, we have, uh, if, if, if I can interrupt, we've got a, a really interesting question um, from online audience. If that's okay, if I can interrupt with that. Um, what I'll, I'll do, I'll read the question out, uh, but at the same time, I think what I might do is. Um, allow um, 
allow Shall Mike Don to uh, to uh, back this up well. with any verbal explanation. So, Mike, Mike's question, um, if you can, is that the building investors like certainty when they bid on a building site. So given that much of the early design performance analysis is very site specific, the simplistic rules required by these investors will be unavailable. How will this be accounted for in the new H1 carbon analysis process? So what, I, what I'll do is I'll allow Mike to talk to back up. If, 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 if. Hi, well, I don't need to, uh, I, I think I, I, it's enough of an explanation. I've been involved in similar discussions about the requirement for wind tunnel testing in Wellington. It would be far easier if we just said, this is the height you're allowed to build for, go away, Mike. And um, you can't actually do that with very site-specific analyses. I'm, I'm curious because I understand the need, if you're looking at bidding against a bunch of other people in an auction or some other situation for a piece of land, you want to know what you're going to get back from that piece of land in a commercial sense. And you want to be able to do it on the back of an envelope is the traditional way of doing things. Uh, I don't particularly like that traditional way of doing things, but I do recognize it's out there. So, so your question is, um, how are we going to provide certainty on the requirements for um, the operation efficiency of a building? Yeah, or, no, no, no. Um, it's, 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 it, the, the, the issue is, I mean, it, it, to me, it's why people like, you must use this R value, you must use this type of glazing, you know, the, the prescriptive approach, because they can do a quick back of the envelope calculation, say, well, I'll meet that bare minimum, barely legal requirement, uh, and therefore the value of the property, I can just look at how much floor area I can put onto that site, if it's a commercial building, for example. Uh, and that certainty disappears if what you have to do is, after buying the site, you do an analysis which is about getting the right performance on that site, which might be as much the form that you can have, the actual floor area you can fit on the site because of daylight, ventilation, whatever it is, requirements. Um, so it's, it's adding complexity when people don't want it uh, was the... Yeah, so, um, yeah, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> um, so I guess it's the balance, isn't it, between, um, yeah, being, being prescriptive, which we know as the, um, you know, being in the team that looks after the building code, that it, you know, the New Zealand building code is a performance-based building code, and yet <laughs> you know, we yeah. publish acceptable solutions and that's what people see as the building code, which is the prescriptive side of it. But the idea mm -hmm. is that, you know, a performance-based building code allows for innovation, for people to, to um, yeah, come up with new ways that meet the overall requirements in a better way using new technology and I guess that is the way that um, that that's the philosophy of this program is you know by setting an envelope um, that says you know here is here is your you know, the limits on your embodied carbon and your operational carbon away you go you know you can meet it by by having a really thermally efficient building you can meet it by having a really good form for your building and being really clever about that. You can meet it by having really efficient building services in it. You can meet it by building it all out of wood. And <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's the um, that's the that's the premise behind it, which is you know in line with a performance based building code. Um, and yes, we know there are challenges and people like prescription. <laughs> <laughs> um, as much as we try and encourage them to, to do other things. But um, yeah, I mean, at the same time as, as we're setting this envelope, um, but, you know, as I said before, I think the idea is that it's, that it's driving um, best, best practice and allowing for that innovation. It's allowing for people to come up with new ways to, to find how to build low carbon buildings. Um, 
we are also looking to, yeah, the, the exist the building code as it stands at the moment with the current code clause H1 and um, yeah, other there are all sorts of other things in different code clauses that have an impact on carbon. I mean, code clause B2 is about um, durability, so it's saying you know how long building uh, components and buildings should should last. Um, so there, right away, you've got an impact on on life and body carbon. I mean, if we could say, well, actually, everything in a building's got to last 50 years, you know, um, that might change a few things in terms of components and, and how we um, yeah, how we think about buildings and, and, and the products and materials that go in them. So yeah, there's all sorts of things in all kind of areas of the building code that, that we know um, impact on the carbon footprint of buildings. And at the same time as setting this upper envelope, we're going to be looking to, to raise the bar by, um, yeah, by through our sort of normal building code update process, making sure that any changes we do are aligning with the objectives of reducing emissions, um, but also spotting any uh, you know barriers that that exist to to um, low carbon construction um, uh, or, or enablers that that you know, we can put in the code to to allow that to happen. I don't think I answered your question very well, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. No problem. I, I, I'd also invite you to ask your second question, Mike. Oh, all right. <laughs> you mean there aren't any others? Sorry. I. I I'm recalling, because I was involved last time we looked at changes to the building code, that uh, there was this assumption that all commercial buildings were the same, uh, and therefore we didn't really need to do anything other than assume that SIPSI engineers would be involved in all commercial buildings, uh, and we needed to focus on houses. That was kind of the brief. Uh, and we really, as a result of a project that I was involved in, know that there's an enormous number of buildings that are labelled commercial that are much, much smaller than the standard 10-storey building that was used to do the cost analysis for the existing building code uh, requirements. Do you have any thoughts? Can you suggest? Are we uh, looking at possibly grades of size, complexity of commercial buildings? Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't think that all commercial buildings are the same. <laughs> it's, it's definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we, we do, yeah, thinking about residential and non-residential buildings is quite often something we, we, just the way that we think about it and sometimes kind of, you know, residential, think, oh yeah, well it's just a house, but then actually, well, you've got attached, you know, now we're moving to more high density um, mm -hmm. apartment type, um, type homes. So there's already quite a variation there. And I think once you realise there's a variation in residential buildings, then you look at commercial buildings, it's like, whoa. <laughs> I don't think anyone's thinking you can pigeonhole um, commercial buildings. You can't do it for residential buildings. Mm -hmm. you can do commercial buildings as well. So so yeah, I think I'd, I'd like to hope, Mike, that we've um, moved on a bit from, from where you were. <laughs> there are definitely you know, it's, it's pretty it's pretty high level and simplistic where we are at the moment in terms of you know we've said right we're going to set these caps um, and and the embodied carbon framework doesn't have any caps in there the operational carbon um, transforming operation efficiency framework does actually have numbers in there four caps you know it's got a blanket number this is what this is what you'll have to meet in five years time um, in terms of um, uh, I'm not sure what it is grams of carbon per meter squared, but on a per meter squared basis is what you have to meet. Now I think I think we all realise that's quite simplistic and for different building types you're gonna have um, yeah different levels of performance and expected performance and what looks good for a warehouse. Simple. Exactly. It looks very different for a yeah sort of um, so yeah it's quite it's 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 pretty simplistic and, and high level at the at the moment. Um, but you know that's where we're looking for you know this feedback and to get as much as we can from the sector about you know what well what is going to work you know what are the real what are the pitfalls that we could fall into with this with this approach what are we going to need to look out for in terms of yeah thinking about different types of commercial buildings um, yeah that's that's the sort of thing that we need to inform our thinking as we come up with this um, you know try and in, in, 
you know, as we put this, implement, implement these these proposals. I realize I'm sitting here nodding my head and I'm on a one way Zoom, so assume oh, that yeah, I'm I nodding my it. head. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, Heath, can, are, are there any more questions from the floor? We've just got a, a couple more from, from my end. Uh, you, you roll ahead. I think um, that's, that's fine. There's some more there. Okay. Um, it, it's actually yeah, it's a it's a question from uh, from me particularly. I think I heard you say, Katie, you're going to look at regulating building material efficiency. Mm. So um, what I meant mean by that is um, um, using materials in an efficient way. So I'm a structural engineer, and there's a phrase in structural engineering called PPI: put plenty in. So <laughs> you're designing something, and you're not being paid a very big fee to design it. Oh, how big does this foundation need to be? You do a quick calc and you're like, okay, well, I'll just double it and then I'll definitely work. Um, so that's the kind of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, um, some of the performance requirements, some of, again, to give another structural, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not a building services engineer, but hopefully it's transferable um, to, to, to building services engineering. Um, you know, when you're designing a floor, the, the floor loads, the, the line loading that we design floors for is massively, massively conservative in terms of what floors will ever experience. So it's, you know, that's something that we could do as the regulator that, you know, we, we reference the standards that say what the building, um, what the loading requirements are. Actually, can we take a fresh look at that and go, well, hang on a minute, we're, we're, we're requiring these massive loads that, that will never never experience in reality, and in order to design for that, you know, these beams are like twice as big as they need to be. You know, that's sort of that's what I meant by material efficiency. It's interesting because like it's that that could have the counter swing in that if it limits future use, of the yes. building, then you end up yeah. having to yeah. build a whole different building. Yeah, um, and that is the trade off. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's looking at um, yeah that um, well. Yeah, it's future flexibility and resilience um, uh, versus not just being blanket. Like, let's just chuck this all in. Um, and there, there is a trade-off there, and I'm really interested. So that's something that I'm particularly interested in, in looking at, especially when it comes to seismic loading. I mean, I'm not saying we should uh, reduce you know, size, seismic loads, but that's a really interesting type of load to design a building for, you know, because we're designing, you know, in Christchurch we're seeing all these buildings put up and, uh, okay, we don't want to fall into the trap of saying, oh, we've had our own quake, we're not going to have it, we're going to have another one for another hundred years, but, um, you know, but it might never happen, and so all these buildings have been designed for these, you know, really big earthquake loads that might never happen. Probably a similar comparison from a building services perspective is the capacity of, say, the cooling plants yeah. that you do design for a really uh, demanding scenario, um, and yet the operational yeah. uh, efficiencies uh, may be achieved at, at lower, lower levels. But yeah. um, and, and that's where I guess getting diversity and connected buildings and um, that sort of thing can help help to yeah. share share some of that um, spare capacity. Or, yeah. But that that might be the sort of aspects that 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 clause relates to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be an example in terms yeah. of yeah. How you, how you manage that? Yeah. Yeah. So just around your, your wider, your more wider, I guess, energy or sustainability goals. Like, has there been any review of you know projected to say you know, 2050 or whatever number that is in the future? That where are most of those buildings being? You know, are they residential buildings? People working from home more or um, you know, um, I guess apartments or so where is where is your low hanging fruit be first bang for your buck? Where you put your energy in to get that converted? Has that been looked at? Yeah. Well, um, uh, we, I mean, we do. You know, like we're saying, we talked about residential and commercial buildings, and um, I don't. I think. I, yeah, we are looking at you know where where is the low hanging fruit? Where, I mean, that's the whole. Point of this, the whole thing about making good policy decisions is, is looking for, for achieving the best outcome for the least cost. Um, but in terms of like, is it you know, 
is it commercial buildings or is it houses? So I, yeah, I don't think we're. Um, I think we're at the stage now where we're just saying, well, look, there's, there's all parts of the construction sector have got a part, to, have got a role to play here. And as we find, as we sort of delve further and, and get further into the program and, and um, more feedback from different parts of the sector, you know, that will inform our view about where we where we do need to focus more energy on, um, you know, more efforts into. So and what's the diverging the population growth of areas and, and how that's serviced and what's so there, there yeah. must be I, I, I guess it's just back into you talking to all these other inter, yeah I, mean, I should also say that um, there's a lot of talk about zero carbon buildings and you know net net zero carbon buildings we haven't yet said that as an objective of this program because as part of the whole of government response to to the to the 2050 goal, we don't know if we have to be net zero, or we don't know when we have to be. It might be we have to be net zero by, you know, 10 years earlier, or you know, it might be that actually we can do. They can do enough saving in, you know, in dairy and, <laughs> and land use and agriculture that we don't actually have to do that much at all. But I think for the moment, where we are, we're. we're um, so that emissions reduction plan, the first draft of that will be published next year, and then we'll be in a better position to know, like, okay, where are the, where are we going to focus on? Uh, you know, what what parts of the sector need to be pushed hard? What parts of the sector need to make? Uh, what parts of the economy need to make really big changes in order to get these efficiency savings, uh, emission savings? But at the moment, um, you know, it's safe to assume that buildings account for a, a hell of a lot of emissions, so we should just be we need to start looking now at what we can do, and I guess that's again that's the idea of setting the um, linking it to a um, to a cap, a kind of head, an, an envelope. So it's what you just got to fit within this envelope. Um, oh, so is the envelope going to link together the two frameworks? Yeah. Uh, oh, um, <laughs> at the moment. Where we've got kind of different different caps, where you know, because I think we're going it, to, it's very likely that we're going to um, implement the caps at different dates, so that will be quite hard to do anyway. So but we have had to say offset a really carbon intensive structure with a really yeah. So we have had feedback that yeah. that is a that is a danger that actually you you could bust a gut to get something you know to get something working really well operationally, whereas actually you might have been able to achieve the same savings quite easily by reducing the bodies. Um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, but there is that trade-off that we have to watch out for, and it's something that we're um, definitely mindful of, and in future might look to, to combine them. And we're already thinking about the sort of tool that I was mentioning about to help the compliance process, having that as doing both. Um, so, kind of, if you've got a tool that's going to do both, why not have a cap that does both? Potentially, because if we sort of do that, um, we've got a, a work in Australia that does that, and it, and it has to look at those trade-offs because, like, you might get massive gains on one, and the other one's dropping yeah. out the window, and yeah. so so it's important to look, yeah. take a step back. Yeah, it? yeah, 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 definitely. We did have we did have quite a few comments in the um, um, consultation about that. So. Okay. Anything else online for us there, Roger? Um, well, actually, it was it was a, it was another question from me, Katie, and it was a, around the line of um, were you going to uh, regulate building material efficiency? But to to start with, you mentioned that you were looking at uh, getting people to prove that they nearly re that they really needed a building, getting the most from buildings. Um, I'm, I'm interested to to hear about yeah. how you might actually stop somebody creating a building on a piece of land. I'm training on, I'm training on dangerous ground here, um, I'll be honest, because I um, I definitely subscribe to the view that the most sustainable building is the one you don't build. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's not, um, and I, and I, I wanted to, we wanted to have that in there as the sort of top line, if you like, of the hierarchy, but, um, but anything, that, yeah, um, we're not aiming to um, discourage building, especially in New Zealand, especially in a post-COVID, you 
know, uh, sector recovery environment. Um, although, although I will still say, I think there's plenty of economic activity to be um, uh, boosted in um, in making use of existing buildings, repurposing existing buildings, refurbishing existing buildings. You know, existing buildings represent embodied carbon that was emitted many years ago. We should be looking to use that as much as possible. Um, Right. So, so by setting, setting the challenging carbon intensity um, targets that you might encourage people to reuse existing buildings more. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's already been pointed out as well, and I'm aware of this, that, you know, we're, I'm talking about, um, we talk about setting caps for both embodied and operational in terms of a per meter squared uh, target. So if you build a building that's twice as big, as a, yeah, a building that's twice as big will have a cap that's twice as high. So there actually isn't an incentive there to reduce your building size. Wow. <laughs> but I still want people to think about it. <laughs> um, but yes, that it's driven by um, yeah, not not wanting to. You know, we're not trying to stop people building. That's good to hear. We're only trying to, we only want people to build, yeah, you know, if you've got, I mean, if a client or a homeowner has got a budget for, you know, budget for building, make, make the most of that money in terms of delivering what it needs for you for the least emissions. It's about, I haven't said carbon literacy yet, it's about carbon literacy, it's about when people are making decisions about designing a building or even deciding to build a building, uh, instead of just thinking about cost and time and quality, they're also thinking about carbon. So, you know, you want to build a house, okay, great, how much money have you got, this much money? Well, instead of building a, you know, 200 square metre house, you could probably build a 150 square metre house that does what you want and that will probably save you money and carbon and you can, you know, do something else with that money that you've saved that will also boost the economy some other way. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, that's an interesting, it's an interesting, um, yeah, question. But yes, I, yeah, it, it, and it's hard to, it is hard to, um, uh, to, to justify economically at the moment that the most sustainable building is a building you don't build. But I'm working on it. <laughs> Right, so I think uh, just keeping an eye on the time, the project manager in me, unfortunately, um, we've got certainly time for one more question. So in, in, uh, we don't seem to have any more online at the moment, but if there's one from the floor in Christchurch, let's... Well, this, this one, uh, when we're talking about the energy efficiency and body energy in the materials, we can all measure that. We're talking about the health, healthy building, we can measure that. What about well-being? How are we going to measure that? Mm. <laughs> That's probably the hardest one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Talking about post occupancy, but is it? Yeah. It's, it's, I it's mean, a, you know, that's a, it's a good thing, but it's, yeah. uh, it's the purpose of you know the, the, the building act is set up with the and, and as part of the program, we've been looking at the building act and does it enable us to to set legislation um, specifically for, um, uh, you know, reducing carbon and climate change outcomes, like not just reducing carbon, but also um, uh, being adaptable to, to future climate changes. Um, but, and, and we think we can do that under the Building Act, but there's something in there in the Building Act about sustainable development. But there is also there in the Building Act, um, yeah, the well-being of occupants is the objective of, you know, of, of the Building Act and the sort of legislation that follows it, such as the Building Code. In terms of how you measure well-being, um, yeah, I, um, I don't know, other than I think you can say that at the moment the rate of, you know, respiratory health issues that we have with, um, uh, you know, residents is not indicative of good well-being. Um, for those households anyway. 
So, um, you know, I think you can start with the, where we've got like quite big, big problems and say, well, that that would be the first place to target. Um, I know, you know, that is maybe that is more health and well-being, but, crime, but I think you can't have crime in here. That is quite good for well-being. Yeah, yeah. Crime will start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah. But there are different, quite yeah. lots of different factors that might need to be analyzed. Yeah, sure. There's an important, it's an important point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, so may, maybe Katie, we, we're absolutely bang on time there. So that's that's fantastic. Um, I think as a as a personal reflection, um, I think you, in, in a way, you're you're pre preaching to a very very um, accepting audience. Uh, if if the message is, you know, people are going to start thinking about energy consumption in all their buildings in the future, we'd go hooray! We're all for it. But uh, we we also see, I think that. Uh, your, your project is going to be one of trying to balance and optimize a huge number of very strong competing and sometimes contrary demands. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I'm 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 not envious of your task, and but but wish you well in it. And uh, and I'm sure all of the uh, SIBSI members here online and in and there in in, uh, in Christchurch will be very keen to keep uh, contributing to the development of this work. Yeah, well, that's great. Thanks. I mean, I, you know, I guess I'd say, you know, it's not, we can't do this in isolation. Like it is definitely going to have to be a whole sector effort. And um, that's why it's about, you know, we, we've gone for, you know, early consultation on some quite high level things that aren't kind of set in stone and they're not even, you know, there's, I was going to say, there's not even much substance to it, that sounds really bad, but there's not, you know, <laughs> We haven't, we haven't, we're not presenting a done and dusted here, this is what we want to do. We've presented, uh, you know, some frameworks and gone, right, there are gaps here, we need to fill in the detail. And uh, it's not just about us coming up with all the answers, you know, it's about bringing, bringing the whole sector involved uh, along, along to make these changes, because otherwise it won't happen. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I, I, I confess, uh, actually, I meant to check. If I I don't are you aware, um, Roger, if Sibsi made a submission to our consultation? Uh, no, I'm I'm not. Um, I think um, the the current ANZ chair, who who is a, a New Zealander, Mark Crawford, would be uh, would be in the best position to say to advise on that. But I'm I'm not I'm not aware myself. Okay. Um, as to uh, what's happened in that uh, in that area, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, okay, so um, what I'd just like to do, if I may, if I can just grab the the screen back to close off. Um, I just I like to. I think you've got it. I think I've got it. Okay, that's great. So I'll just share with um, the audience. Hopefully, you can see that. Just the link to uh, Weblink where those uh, this presentation will be available for you to see again at your leisure um, and also just to remind everybody that if you'd like to keep in touch with SIDSI uh, via LinkedIn or YouTube there are some uh, mechanisms for, for that. Um, so uh, yeah on, on, on that I'd like to close thank you all very much for the presentation and um, down in Christchurch you go and have your nice long weekend and We'll keep the country going up here in Auckland. <laughs> <laughs>